I'm here to help Innovate Mississippi celebrate its 17th year of holding this conference. Uh, it's all about creativity, innovation. It's about getting uh, our creative juices flowing, uh, getting inspired to be more creative, uh, innovative, uh, and transformative for Mississippi's economy. The purpose of the conference is to bring together the startup and innovation community in Mississippi. A lot of people that operate independently, starting companies, developing new technologies, looking at problems that we all want to solve. Bring them together, trade ideas, trade techniques, see what other people are doing. Uh, it's a little bit of cut and paste uh, of technology. Maybe solutions that one work in one area will work in another. Uh, it's a little bit of a cheerleading adventure uh, to, to show people what successes some people are having so that you know, somebody can say, well, if they can do it here, I can do it here. So it's, it's to trade best practices to some extent and techniques. It brings creative people together, first of all, and it, it brings people who are of a mindset to stop doing things the way we've always done it and to look for opportunity and to, through innovation, whether it's technology or otherwise. Bill Raven did a great job of talking about the fact that you have to, to go against the tide uh, a lot of times. You have to, have to swing for the fences and be a risk taker. We need more risk takers in our economy if we're going to grow Mississippi's economy today. I think the successes that we've had in Mississippi, uh, it is so impressive to hear different uh, startups and different entrepreneurs. Um, I, I was listening to the competition that they had, the, the Shark Tank type competition they had, and uh, they were telling me about the third place winner was this incredible idea, and I thought if that's the third place winner, what's the first place winner, you know? So uh, I just think we have a lot of opportunities here in Mississippi. We have such creative, smart folks here, and we need to support them in order to grow our economy, in order to uh, have a better workforce, and, and that's what I'm looking for as a, a in, in government in Mississippi. Hi, uh, my name is Russ Davis. I'm with School Status. Uh, I'm going to do a quick presentation um, about running a successful startup, and uh, I don't know how applicable it is to what you guys are trying to do, but it's just some tips and tricks that we've picked up over the years that have uh, some things that we did right, and more importantly, some of the things we did wrong. Uh, to help you uh, kind of guide your way if you're thinking about uh, doing what we're doing. Um, you already knew who I am. That's a very lovely bio. Written by our marketing department, obviously. I think you can tell that uh, very verbose our marketing folks are, so sorry about that. Uh, basically, I've been doing this since 2012. Uh, before that, I have worked for or with public education my entire life since I was 15 years old. Family full of educators, mom and dad, both sisters. I'm the youngest. I don't teach. Uh, but it's a family business, right? So you got to find some way to contribute, and this is what we do. So, um, so this is an. Ex uh, so, what is this? What is this presentation? So, this is an example of what we did. This isn't a guide on what you must do. Um, there are tons of things that we wish we wouldn't have done, or some things that we may have regretted. Um, I'm just going to try to help you through some of those, right? So, yesterday I judged the Venture Challenge competition, and a lot of those folks are starting new businesses. And this presentation is kind of geared towards some of those folks, but also um, some folks that may have some uh, younger companies. Um, we're a software as a service company. That means that people pay us. It's not a traditional box software that you go pick up at Office Depot or anything like that. Uh, it's a subscription-based service. So whenever people go to use our service, they pay us a flat fee that renews at 100% every year. Um, so uh, we have the luxury of building on revenue year over year over year. Um, we started out with one employee, which was me, and then two, and then three, and then four, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we have roughly 20, I think it's more like 25 now uh, since this presentation was done. And uh, basically what we do is that we help parents and teachers and administrators uh, take a look at student data that's running around because how many of you have kids in public school? Right? They collect tons and tons and tons of data points, right? Uh, reading programs, state assessments, discipline, um, attendance, uh, benchmark assessments, accelerated reader and math. How many of you have had to read with your kids for their accelerated reader points? Uh, basically, we take all that data, we kind of put it in one place, and we help them make smart instructional decisions based upon that data. So before, if you were to think about it, they have like, you guys have apps on your phone, right? So you have probably, average person has like 38 apps on their phone. School districts are very much the same thing. They have apps. So you know how you have to log in to each and every app in order, you know, it's a different way to log in to each and every one. Uh, what we do basically is that we take the data from the apps and we put it behind one kind of view so that they can see all the data that they need to see about a student. So that's basically what we do. Which, which really isn't important. This is where our uh, company got started, actually. 
Um, we were, uh, I was staying at a, a nice hotel with some friends of mine, and uh, this is at the Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans, um, and this is the club level lounge. Me and two other guys literally sat at that uh, chess table. We knocked off the chess, pe chess pieces, and we started sketching out our company and kind of the way that we wanted to do things and, and what we wanted to create. So very humble beginnings. Um, I'm not classically trained to do this. I went to Mississippi State, um, but there's not a course on how to be a CEO, right? Or how to run a startup. There just doesn't exist. So uh, you kind of have to feel, it, feel your way through it, which is kind of what we've done. Um, this is some of our employees. Uh, there are about six or seven more that we've uh, since added since then. But um, you think you have pressure, you know, uh, try putting, you know, 25 other families and you know their, their daughters and their sons and their, you know, their wives and some of them are single breadwinners. And so it starts to put a lot of pressure, right? And you have to think about that whenever you make decisions. But honestly, for all the pressure and for all the, the sacrifice and everything else, it's truly the most rewarding thing that I've ever done in my entire life. I've done other things, but um, working and it, like building a company and then bringing your friends with you, that's really truly the best thing that I can do, I think. Um, and creating a lasting thing, changing the course of not only their lives, but the lives of their children, hopefully. Um, that's some, you know, that's some real great stuff for me. So that's the kind of, that's the cloth that I'm cut from. Some people aren't cut from the same cloth, but that is a cloth that I'm cut from is trying to build something and uh, bring folks along with you. Um, let's see, uh, that's really not important for you guys. All right, so we got to talk about making that money, right? Because that's really what's important in a business. We live in Mississippi, okay? Uh, so there are, there are companies that, you know, you can go out to Silicon Valley and, you know, you can do the Sand Hill Road Challenge and see how much money you can come up with. Some people will give you money for these crazy concepts. Mississippi just isn't that place, right? There's not a lot of venture capital money and people really expect a return, right? So the concept of, like, yesterday I was listening on the radio and Giphy, which is the people that make or that on your phone that let you like send animated gifts to other people, uh, they're worth six hundred million dollars. If you're if you're me, that makes you want to throw up a little bit, right? Because you think, my God, you know, think of all the work we do, and these guys are doing animated gifts, and they're worth six hundred million dollars. So you have to figure out a way to make that money. You got to figure out a way to start. We always said, great, whatever we want to do is awesome, but we have to figure out something that people are actually willing to pay for, right? That's really what driving a business is about. Lots of ideas, people out there. Uh, those people, uh, ideas, people without a way to make money, you know what they are? Employees. They don't start companies because, or if they do, they're not in business for very long. You have to figure out a way to monetize your idea. It doesn't matter how good it is. You have to figure out at some point a way to make money on it. So uh, we chose something that we were familiar with, which is education. You can choose something outside of your comfort zone, but you need to understand the problem uh, before you can really solve it. So we have a lot of people that come into education. They said, hey, you know, I shaved 500 milliseconds off a of search at Google, and I can come in and I could, quote, fix education right? Uh, that indicates a true lack of understanding of what truly the problems are, right? If, they, if the problems were easy to fix, it's not a lack of depth or lack of understanding. They really are. They require heavy lifting to fix them, right? That's why they haven't been fixed before. So uh, you really need to understand the, the, what you're getting into. I wouldn't, for instance, go into um, uh, law enforcement and try to fix a lot of their problems because I don't really understand all the problems that law enforcement has. So I, but I do understand a lot about education, which is why I try to say there. I'm not saying you have to stay in your comfort zone, but it really helps if you kind of understand where you're coming from. Um, but keep it simple. Don't try to bite off too much. That's a common problem. We're going to change the world. You're probably not, right? Um, you should really focus on something that's laser specific. I, I like to focus on problems that are legitimate issues that people have that um, there's a technical solution for that isn't always obvious. But if you can solve a problem, people are willing to pay you most of the time to solve that problem for it if it's a real problem. Um, strip the problem down to its essence before you try to do it at first. And uh, if you don't do that, if you don't strip it down and understand every little piece of it and how to fix it, then, uh, then you're probably not going to be successful. Um, too many startups consider how to make money last, right? Uh, we'll just build a bunch of, we'll build an app and we'll have a bunch of users and they fold left and right, left and right, left and right. And it's because they have no way to monetize their idea. We have competitors right now that live in our space that they're, they're going under. We had a company that just uh, blew through $40 million in funding in 18 months, right? $40 million, it's a lot of money. If I had $40 million, I could take over the world, right? Uh, but you, those guys had no way to monetize their idea. They had a great idea, but nobody's willing to pay for it. So 
uh, business runs on capital. So it doesn't matter how great your idea is. If you don't have a way to monetize it, um, you know, you really don't have uh, an idea at all. If someone isn't willing to pay to solve the problem you're solving or pay to have those customers, then it's going to be tough to make it. Um, free isn't a financial model, right? Uh, freemium is a tough financial model, like getting people to click that button and actually convert from being free to paid. How many of you have ever done that in your entire life? One, two out of what, 20? It's just too low of a conversion rate. I don't care how great your idea is. I pay for Pandora, I pay for Spotify, I pay for Apple Music, um, and I pay for HBO and, and Showtime. Those are my paid free, those are my paid apps, that's it. Right? And I have, what, 40 other apps on my phone that I just click right through the ads and just say, okay, I'm not paying you a dime, right? So you really have to think about that. Um, most likely, you'll end up uh, charging somebody to do something, and what does that look like? So the questions are to consider, what are you going to charge, what is your market size, and what is the purchasing cycle? So if you're not selling to customers, let's say you're selling to banks, or you're selling to law enforcement, or you're selling to education, whatever you're doing, right? What is the purchasing cycle? Who holds the cash? Uh, and sometimes we separate our users from our, cons from our customers, right? So for instance, in our, in our app, most of our users are teachers, right? Do teachers cut checks in school districts? Absolutely not. I wish they did. We'd be a lot better, better off. We'd be able to sell a lot more. But you have to have something that meets the needs of both the people that are consuming your product and the people who are cutting the check for your product, right? You have to think about both of those people and solving those problems. Uh, get yourself legal. Uh, because no good news ever arrives in a certified letter. Nothing good ever arrives in a certified letter, ever. I've had huge checks come in, never come in a certified letter. Comes in a regular number 10 envelope with a stamp on it, right? $200,000 checks, crazy. But a certified letter, rarely good news, if ever. Um, register with the Secretary of State. Uh, we are an LLC. LRC, LLCs are usually cheap and easy to do. Um, you can register online with uh, Delbert Hoseman's site in just a few minutes. Um, in fact, I registered a new LLC with someone just recently and it took me about 10 minutes. Nothing to do. No reason not to do it. Um, LLCs are structures that are passed through entities for taxation purposes. So I'm not your tax, <clears throat> I'm not your lawyer, I'm not your accountant, but I can tell you from a taxation perspective that revenue will just pass right through in your 1040 if you have any revenue. Um, if it's just you, then you really don't need an operating agreement. If you have multiple people in an LLC, get an operating agreement. Operating agreements govern how the way LLCs work. If you don't have an operating agreement and you have a dispute, guess what? I'll see you in court. And then, if you, then it's really up to that judge to decide upon how that's going to work. When do people take distributions from the company? Uh, partnerships are usually a bad idea, frankly. Somebody needs to lead, in my opinion. Um, and that person needs to be the leader, and then you need to have Indians and chiefs, basically. And the Indians can have stock in the company, but somebody needs to lead. Like co-ventures, uh, the only one I could think of that was even moderately successful was RIM, which was uh, your BlackBerry company, and now they're being sold for parts, right? They had two CEOs. Somebody has to lead a company. <clears throat> um, how, many, how will members get paid? Who owns what? Uh, what is everybody expected to do? And make sure that you assign everyone's work in the LLC. This happens a lot. Somebody starts a new venture, they come up with an idea while they're working for a company, and they go, hey, this is a really good idea. I don't think I'm going to give it to the company I'm working for, even though I'm working with their equipment on their time, et cetera. So you have to have an assignment of that intellectual property to make sure that your company is, actually has something so that if somebody's working for you, they don't just take the concept that they're working on and go start up uh, small status instead of school status and start doing the exact same thing. So you have to have some intellectual property uh, protection there. And you can usually have that in just setting up either an operating agreement and then individual employment agreements with your companies. Um, don't get caught up in job titles. Focus on responsibilities. Yesterday, whenever everybody was doing the Venture Challenge, oh, I'm the chief financial officer. I'm the chief whatever officer. There are four people in the company, right? None of that matters. It looks great on a business card, but honestly, I get a 1,000 business cards a day. None of it matters. Focus on what people are going to do. Worry about the job titles later. Your chief financial officer, if you start a startup, is not going to be your chief financial officer. Do yourself a favor. Don't call him that. Call him something else, right? Save those titles for whenever you actually grow up and you become a big company and you could have those things. So we have directors. We don't have chiefs. Um, Get an EIN for the IRS, open a bank account, get QuickBooks when you receive $1. Don't try to run a company out of your checkbook. It's going to be a nightmare at tax time. Your accountant will hate you. I promise. Trust me. I know. Um, keep your receipts. Uh, even if, if you're sinking money into legit business expenses, it'll save you come tax time. Um, 
And then um, what's an MVP? MVP is a minimum viable product, right? So what do you need to make money? Build that and only that. That's what we did. Um, what is the least amount of product required to make any significant amount of money? That's what an MVP is. That if you're building software or you're building a company, don't try to add all the bells and whistles. Whenever you're building a hot fudge sundae, ice cream and fudge, maybe a cherry. Don't add the sprinkles, don't add the nuts, don't add all this other stuff. It's just going to take time. Time is your enemy whenever you're creating a startup because other people will come up with your idea eventually. And your, your number one advantage whenever you create a startup, if you have a unique idea, is you are first, right? Right? And then maybe you have 18 months after that before people start copying you, right? So you have to come up with an MVP, you have to get to market, and you have to start selling that product. So make a list of those features on paper, the things that you want to do, make a list of those things, prioritize them, and then remove a bunch of them, right? Just figure out the bare minimum that someone is willing to pay for. Not even a lot of money, because you can upsell those customers later, but start getting paying customers to help the bleed of starting a company, okay? Uh, an MVP needs to be super lean. If bells A, B, and C are required and they don't develop, uh, don't develop whistles D, E, and F until you have those complete. An MVP will help you test your concept, generate revenue, and decide upon how viable and how serious of a company you actually have. If you create an MVP and nobody buys it, and you add a few more features and nobody buys it, you should really start considering, is this something people are actually willing to pay for, or is this going to be a hobby that I sink a lot of money into? There are a lot of hobbies out there. People have a lot of hobby companies. You should really consider, is this a hobby? And if it is, make sure your wife understands that it's a hobby and you're never going to make any money doing it. Um, and I've had businesses fail, right? That's another thing. Believe it or not, when you go to raise money, am I right, Joe? People look for failure. They look for companies that weren't successful. I had a company that I spent 100000 my whole life savings, every dollar I'd ever made in my entire life. I invested into that company and spent it all within eight months and was penniless, right? And then I had one of those, and then I did some consulting work, and I built myself back up and created another product, and, and here we are. We're a multi-million dollar company. So, you know, if you don't succeed, if that idea doesn't resonate with the marketplace, the number one characteristic, according to top CEOs, do you know what the number one characteristic over pedigree, over education, over just about any other characteristic, even uh, product strength, do you know what the number one defining characteristic of sales, of leaders of organizations are for why they're successful? They did not quit persistence. Number one thing, every, almost every CEO will tell you that, I want to quit 10 times a day. Uh, it's true. Some days are better than others, but I, sometimes I want to quit 10 times a day. My staff knows this. They know those days. Um, whenever that happens, you just have to persist. You have to stay there and dig into it. But you also have to realize if there's no money coming in and there aren't any customers and people aren't willing to pay for this, maybe this isn't the right time for this idea. Maybe I should shelve it, go back to my day job, go doing some other stuff, right? Um, this is our MVP for school status. People paid for this product, and I feel embarrassed that they did, right? Because it wasn't very good. But it helped us establish a small base. I mean, this is so basic. It was just some graphs on a screen. People weren't willing to pay a lot of money for it, but they did, right? And we built this product. Uh, we built the product in about 90 days uh, from start to finish. It was one programmer working on it, our third employee. This was our first app. And so this is how it started from very humble beginnings. And now we have... Uh, I think we have 56,000 users, and uh, we have over a million students that we manage the data on behalf of their districts, right? So it started from this, and it went to that, and it went there in four years. So to say that, you know, start something small and then build from there. Don't try to build it all at once. It'll never get off the ground. And don't quit your day job, right? If you can do it on the side, do it on the side. Uh, you need to make that money for a while. Uh, if you're waiting tables, keep waiting tables. Don't quit your day job until you have sufficient revenue to do so. That's jumping off a really big cliff. Whenever you start talking about not making the mortgage payment or not making the house payment or car payment, that's serious stuff. You need to have all those things covered before you ever consider getting into your business. A lot of people get into tax trouble whenever they start a business. Do you know why? Because they're not making enough money to pay their taxes, and they think, well, I don't have to owe these taxes for another four months or whatever it is, and they end up getting into tax trouble. If you ever listen to daytime radio, every single commercial is, are you in tax trouble? Do you have tax debt over $10,000? Blah, 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 blah. And it's targeted, who's listening to the radio in the middle of the day? Guys like me, small business guys driving around, 
going from show to show to show or doing whatever they're doing. And it's because people in our demographic will get into tax trouble. So if you're not making enough money to pay your taxes and pay yourself, you're not making enough money to quit. Um, we were able to launch because we had another project that was making money, but we knew it was limited. I had a wife who supported me financially. I, I had a sugar mama. It's the truth. My wife had just uh, gone through CRNA school. She works for UMC. Um, literally, I made zero income for over a year. Most people don't have that. Most people won't have that. Try to convince your spouse of that. I couldn't drunkenly convince my wife of that now. She would never do it again. Um, because she, she got out of uh, school, she worked all this time, and then we only had one income. Um, if you can figure out a way to do it, do it. Uh, but don't work on your, comp your other company's dime because they can assert that the thing that you've been working on is theirs, and it is theirs. So work on it truly on your spare time, be able to document it. If you receive an email in your work computer, uh, then that, can, uh, that, is not, that is business related to your business, they can try to pull your intellectual property into their ownership if you've got something truly great. Um, and appearance is everything. The internet's a great place. You can outsource phone, fax, email. Don't go out and get a bunch of AT&T lines and pay hundreds of dollars for telecommunications expenses. We pay pennies per minute, we still do. Um, find things that are cheap. Um, use a calling service. It makes a big difference. We use uh, a company called Answer and Connect, Answer Connect for a long time. So when somebody called, they actually got a live human being to answer the phone. They sounded very professional, even though it was essentially three guys in a garage. Um, we had that, and that perception really, really matters when a customer calls and somebody answers the phone. Um, and here's some things that we learned the hard way. I'm almost finished, I promise. I know this sounds like the Micro Machines guy if you're a child of the 80s. But um, get an accountant early, super early. I'm working with a startup today. They're a food service startup. They had a $260,000 profit. They'll have audited financials this year on $260,000 profit, right? And the reason that they do that is because audited, financial, audited financials, when you go to raise money, are solid gold. They need to be audited um, by a credited, uh, credited CPA firm. Uh, we pay uh, uh, Horn is, is our CPA. I think most people either pay Horn or Butler Snow in one form or fashion or another. It's crazy. Um, have an accountant that enables you to get clean audited financials. If you're small, this expense should only be a few thousand dollars. That sounds like a lot. But if you're going to seek a line of credit from a bank or obtain VC money, then you really need audited financials. Get a reliable accounting system early and stick with it. We switched, and it was a horrendous mistake. We should have picked a better accounting system to start with. Produce monthly financials, P&L, cash flow. Um, those, even though you're, you'll feel silly generating the P&L and cash flow if you're only making a few thousand dollars a month, but looking at these financials and getting in the habit of looking at cash flow, looking at what your runway is, uh, most companies don't do that until somebody makes them do it, and then they realize they're losing a lot money than they thought it was. It also requires you to, to itemize your receipts and do all the things you need to be doing anyway. Um, don't run your company from a checkbook. You'll be headed for bankruptcy. It, it's just a really hard thing to do. Um, recruiting talent's the hardest thing I do. Uh, we found the company. Uh, and we wanted to create, and we determined that the talent that we were likely to find, um, we added benefits early. We built benefits into our model. We, we provide, from day one, we've provided health care, vision, dental, the whole nine yards to all our employees from day one. We think it's part of our DNA to treat our employees as best as we can. We're one of the few companies on the planet that will tell, that will tell a customer that our employees are more important than our customers, because without our employees, we have no product. There are other customers in the world. Right, our, our employees are very valuable to us. Um, let's see, benefits, benefits. Um, have, a, have a meaningful planning session in the beginning of what you want to build, uh, not the software, but the company. Talk about the company you want to build, what your value system is, right? Um, culture is our number one recruiting tool. We recruit people against larger companies that pay more money every single day. Uh, we just recruited three guys that work for larger companies here in Jackson, paying them the same or less money because they want to work for a company that they have freedom to operate. We're not making them punch a clock or anything crazy like that. Culture, ma culture matters. Um, and that's well, the end. There are two kinds of innovation. First kind is doing something new. And the second kind is doing what you do today, but doing it better. And that's true for every walk of life in, in the public sector, in state government, local government. Doing something better, more efficiently, is good for all of us, number one. And number two, when people come up with new, innovative things, that makes our quality of life better. It, it gives us more time to do the things we want to do. Well, certainly for me as a member of Congress and a uh, self-titled uh, ambassador for Mississippi, you have to tell these success stories. When you look at companies like uh, Camgen, you look at Basecamp, 
you look at success stories like Siemens Composites down in Gulfport, Mississippi, or Preci uh, Precision Spine in Pearl, these are things that we need to show because it, and they should be things that are taught in our schools so that young people say, you know, there are people here that have been successful. We want our young people, as they're educated through high school and college, to know their best opportunities for their future are in Mississippi. And we want them to be taught here and to come back here and contribute to the great success of our state. We don't give Innovate Mississippi enough in the way of, of state support for what they're trying to do. We don't encourage uh, uh, as much private sector investment in this as we should, should probably be doing. Uh, we need to, to create places where this innovation can take place uh, that are friendly to uh, young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general, uh, whether, whether it's, it's um, office space, whether it, it's uh, the technical infrastructure, uh, whether it, it, it's um, uh, putting the kinds of, of um, angel resources in place that will help folks with great ideas get off the ground. You probably share a common set of goals. You probably express it differently. Uh, but in the end, you know, we're, we're focused on uh, common advancement. Where we differ is the goal, the techniques that get us there. And if we can focus on goals that we agree on, uh, that's probably, a, in the current environment, that's probably uh, the best we can hope for. Find elements of agreement that, um, for instance, we income inequality is an issue, that uh, how do we fix it? Basecamp Coding Academy would be a way of reducing it because they take people that wouldn't otherwise have a future and turns them into you know, successful coders with a job. Both the conservative and the liberal causes can get behind that. That would be an example of bridging the gap at the moment. The main thing I hope everybody takes from this conference is I hope they say, if that guy can do it, I can do it. In other words, I'm going to go out and do it, and I'm going to make things happen.